call up a bunch of pictures on this. Uh, watch video number four. Uh, <laughs> I think it, the, DNA is so complex. I mean, it's unbelievably complex. One DNA molecule is beyond comprehension in its complexity. Just the DNA found in one cell in your body right now is much greater than all the computer programs ever written in the history of man combined. That's all found in one cell in your body. So to think that this happened by chance is just fairy tale stuff. Now, I don't object to anybody believing in that. You can believe in the Tooth Fairy, Easter Bunny, Santa Claus, evolution. I don't care what you believe in. But don't call it science and don't make me pay to put it in the schools. That's all I'm saying. They ought to keep that stuff at home or start a private school and teach evolution to those that want to pay and come learn it. That would be fair. How many minutes was that? How many minutes was that? Uh, seemed like more. Okay. DNA similarity is something that can be measured. DNA similarity means you take a long sequence of DNA from one organism and a long sequence from another and you line them up and you see how many differences there are. It's actually more complicated than that, but uh, there are ways to do it. And the, the, you can measure the distance between do two DNA molecules as the, basically the number of changes or mutations that would be necessary to change one into the other. Uh, now, you might be interested to know that apes and humans have DNA where 99 out of every 100 subunits of the DNA are the same. Now, it would be interesting to ask uh, Dr. Hovind um, which one was made in the image of the other because uh, that amount of similarity is pretty suspicious if they were created independently. If two of my students brought term papers in and I looked through them and I found that of 1,000 words, 990 were the same, I would begin to suspect a little bit of uh, plagiarism. But in, uh, in evolution, it makes sense that related, more similarly related organisms will have um, more similar DNA, and that's exactly what we find. And it's consistent across all the parts of the DNA. Now, I don't know what he was saying about cytochrome C of sunflowers and humans. Uh, that sounds like it's at odds with everything I've read. The octopus eye is not at all similar to the human eye. It has the retina, uh, the retina and the, um, uh, and the nerves the opposite way around from what human eyes have. And so the octopus and human eyes are not uh, evidence for a common designer by any means. Thank you. I will start again with you, Dr. Paulson. How do you explain the relationship of apes and humans to the Neanderthals? Isn't it true that living things evolved to meet their ecosystem Organisms can evolve from rocks, but live by constant chemical reactions. Um, could you repeat that? Yeah, please. <laughs> <laughs> sure. How do you explain the relationship of apes and humans to the Neanderthals? Isn't it true that living things evolve to meet their ecosystem? Organisms can evolve from rocks, but live by constant chemical reactions. Well, there's three questions there. Do I get six minutes? <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> I'll just take two, because the second two don't make much sense. Actually, uh, the first one, apes and humans and Neanderthals. Uh, Neanderthals, as far as I'm aware, are, a, uh, are a, um, an ancient uh, form of human being, probably still Homo sapiens, that uh, is really very similar to modern man. Uh, mitochondrial DNA from um, Neanderthals has been studied, taken from uh, the bones of Neanderthals, and uh, there's about four times, as, I think it's like four or five times as much difference between the Neanderthals and modern humans 
as between uh, different groups of modern humans. So the idea is that they were a group that diverged from the main line that led to modern humans uh, some hundreds of thousands of years ago. Uh, the other thing about evolving from a rock, uh, well, if life evolved from um, non-living matter, then um, obviously some uh, inorganic substances became part of organic living cells. But uh, let's see, I don't quite see what that has to do. What was the second part of that? The rock and the constant chemical reactions or something? Uh, I think I'll just leave that one. I confess I don't understand the question either. Uh, I do have a good part of it. As far as humans and Neanderthals, I think the evidence indicates, even though Neanderthals are presented as part of the evolutionary chain in the typical textbook, um, the evidence from the Neanderthals is that they are just human. They're within the range of humans. They are, they were, the 4% difference that he mentioned is certainly still within the range of humans. Dr. Cuazzo has written a fascinating book on this called Buried Alive. He was one of the few men to actually go study the actual bones. Most people, when they study fossils and learn about evolution, they get to study a copy of the fossil, a, f a casting or a replica. You ought to read this book, Buried Alive. You can get it through my ministry or get it through him. He lives in New Jersey. I'll get you his phone number if you want. Call him, ask him any questions directly. He's a dentist. He studied ne Neanderthals very thoroughly and wrote this very conclusive book about it. He said, folks, they're just a human that most of them had acromegaly, excessive sec secretion of growth hormone in old age. The th bones in the forehead start to get thicker. When a person passes 80 or 90 years of age, the forehead starts to thicken, gets uh, thick-headed. Uh, <laughs> and he's thinking these people are probably over 100, and uh, they develop slower. He found much evidence of slower, delayed maturation. Today, people mature and are able to produce children when they're 12 and 13. These are probably more like 16 or 18 or 20, delayed maturation. Uh, and it's just a fascinating book answering about the Neanderthals. As far as... Uh, Humans or anything coming from a rock, that's my whole point. It didn't happen. But ultimately, if you boil away the big words, the evolutionist has to believe we came from a rock 4.6 billion years ago. I mean, there's no way out of the argument. That's what they believe. They keep trying to hide and say, well, we're only talking about living organisms evolving. Well, then get the rest of the stuff out of the books. For help, Join me. Help me get that stuff out of there. That would be a good cause. All right, thank you. We have 10 minutes remaining in our question and answer session, and we'd like to take the opportunity for each doctor to present a question to the other and then allow them two minutes to respond to that. So we'll start with Dr. Paulson, if you'd like to ask um, Dr. Hovind a question. Yeah, get or, him we, can, get or we can start with the other, either or. Do you have a question? Oh, I've got lots of questions, right. sure. Uh, <laughs> we'll start with you. I still would like to know, you mentioned that there's libraries full of evidence for evolution. Would you please simplify it down? What is the best evidence you know of? You said you studied this for 28 years. What is the best evidence you know of of any kind of animal producing a different kind? You mentioned about the gull, the white and the black gull. Uh, if that is not your best evidence, please tell me what is. Don't just say there's lots of evidence. Just please tell me your best one. Will you tell me first what a kind is? I did. Uh, you may said I didn't give the definition of kind, and I did. I said animals that originally were able to reproduce uh, living, viable offspring. 